We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners in Burke Britain Financial Bar. That's on the track. We are back up the track. It's on the track. I'm on so this is episode number 83 of the Finances Podcast. One of my usual suspects is joining me, Ben Kemp. How are you, Ben? Good, Jay. Back again. Been a little while. It has been a little while. And guest today is James Ramos from, let me get this right, Utilize IT. Oh, Utilitize, but yeah. Utilitize. It's, yeah, ben, it's, it's, it's a play on my work. fault. And so. Utilitize IT. So it was, I should have... Uh, phonetically work that out before we jumped on. Anyway, I've, I reckon I've messed up 70% of the introductions that I've done in those podcasts. It's uh, now just par for the course. So James, thanks for joining us today. No worries. Thanks for having me. Now, we were talking just before we started recording and I think I was having a chat with my wife this morning about all things cyber security. And I think if there were probably the hot topics for nearly everyone at the moment, it is cyber security and people getting scammed and probably AI. I mean, they're the two things that are probably front of mind for most people, whether you're young, you're at school and you're using AI technology or you're my parents and my in-laws age and they're getting emails every... I was going to say, it's almost the the different demographics and and don't pigeonhole people, but the the older people are worried about getting scammed and then the younger people are trying to work out how do we leverage this AI. Yeah, And there's a crossover in the middle. Where you sort of see a bit of both. Yeah. So that, that kind of falls right into your wheelhouse, James, of what you're doing at, say it again, utilitize, utilitize yeah. IT. Don't say it too many times. <laughs> no. <laughs> so before we get to AI and cybersecurity, let's introduce you and who you are, where you come from, and your background, ultimately leading up to the point where you're in your role you are today with Utilitize IT. No worries. So I guess, yeah, my... my I was brought up in Geelong and started my life working in an ice cream van and having that engagement with people and selling ice cream. And then... What was the name of the ice cream van? Can you remember? Uh, yeah. It's, 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 it's a family, family business, business isn't Yeah, family yeah, yeah. business. So dad still runs most of the vans and stuff like okay. that. What, so what, down what Mr. Mr. Wizzy Mobile Ice Cream. Oh, so you'll see... Everyone down, knows Mr. Wizzy. <laughs> yeah. So down there, down the um, down Eastern Beach. Yes. So, uh, yeah, grew up in a van and all the summers in the van and then thought, no, I need to get out of it. So... I, um, Do we get discounted, Mr. Wizzy? Can we put a promo code? My kids are going to listen to this and want, <laughs> want to go down to Eastern Beach straight away. So. Oh, well, yeah. Come, we'll come down. Drop your name. Oh, you won't see me in a van. But there's, there's, <laughs> I'm I think going to drop your name anyway. Oh, yeah. Well, the, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, I started my sort of IT career at Cotton On. So started there on the service desk and, yeah, really in sort of understanding IT. So I thought I wanted to try and have a, I guess, a technical sort of there's something to fall back on. So I thought, well, I didn't go to uni. I went straight into the workforce to... Try and learn on the spot. And then, um, were you into tech and computers at school or not really? Yeah, I was actually telling someone yesterday. My dad got, had a cubby house at home, and when I was, you know, had old enough to hold, hold a screwdriver, he would bring computers and stuff from the recycle center, and I'd pull them apart. And my cubby house had full like the Matrix type things, screens and keyboards, and it was it was great for the imagination. So I'm probably a real young nerd. He's built right. NASA in his backyard. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. What, what do you have in your backyard then? Cover yes, but nothing like that in it. <laughs> nothing exciting. Do you have at a calculator all. in yours or something? No, I definitely no. I think maybe a bat and ball, and that was about I it. Think you had a pack of Mum's cigarettes in the <laughs> Alpine extra lights. <laughs> <laughs> I swam between the flags. I was a bit of a pussy. So yeah. So computers and fairly interested in that school. You didn't go to uni. No. And so <clears> post no. school, what did you do? What did you decide you wanted to do? Well, I just wanted to start working, to be honest, and just try and get my hands dirty and, and get into the some sort of career. And then I thought, I actually studied to be a real estate agent. So I did that and I thought, well, didn't go down that path. Why did, why did you not want to do real estate? Not really sure, really. I just, uh, not sure. I just, yeah, I thought I want to try and sell houses. I wanted to have like 10 houses by the time I was 30 and have that sort of thing. But I had one, but that yep. was close enough. But um, I just thought, I think my dad told me, just have some sort of, background so then you can always fall back on it if you want to yeah if, if something doesn't work out so you can you have that sort of technical side of things to fall back like a, a bricky or a carpenter yeah skill so i chose it so i thought well everyone's going to use computers and yeah, i liked them so but yeah i found it I, cotton on was really good start for me so it was sort of really broad in which 
uh, what I was working with. So it was engaging with customers, working with IT, learning on the spot as well. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And they were a big, big company at that time as well, and even bigger now. So that was about 12 years ago, I think I was working for them. So yeah, progressed from there. Then I ended up moving to Adelaide and worked in a school over there as assistant admin, network assistant admin. And that was really big personally as well. So I moved out of home, a new state, new friendship groups, new job, new everything. It was, yeah, a pretty steep learning curve for me. And I was like, oh, way out of my depth here. But I think it's probably one of the best things I ever did because I had to grow as a person and yeah, I think grew up really quick. So that was when I was about 22, I think, 21, 22. Yeah, really enjoyed it over there. I was in Adelaide for, I think, seven years and then it was a time to move back. And then went into Torquay College as the IT manager there. So I learned a whole new skill set there. And from there, I went to Gen U as a business systems analyst. So working with uh, the wider business, understanding their sort of problems, and then working with the dev team to create something. And then uh, Stephen Gray, who's the director of Utilitize, I sort of spoke to him throughout my, my work and life. I've known him since I, he's my first basketball coach when I was eight, I think. And yeah, sort of told him where I was sort of at with my career. And he said, well, I've got a big opportunity you know, this is what we're sort of doing with my business and a few other businesses were sort of growing as well. So I thought, well, I want to be a part of that. So it was so just, what year was that? That was six months ago. Okay. Yeah. When I, I've only been with, yeah, Utilitize six months now. But How long has Utilitize been in? So they've been around since 2016. Yep. So I guess a background on that, Stephen Gray, he's, I've had to make note of all the places he's been, but he's been at Coles, Target, Spotless, Transurban, AWB and head of IT at KPMG. So he's had a range of experience and you know he's I find he always has the answer to my question before I ask the question he's just that's sort of so I've seen so many scenarios in yeah big... so I guess the reason why he started Utilitize was he wanted to bring that enterprise expertise into those small to medium-sized businesses so he saw a real gap there with you know large companies have that really big budget to throw into IT and do all those type of things where those smaller companies didn't so he wanted to try and bring all that knowledge that he's sort of had throughout the years and bring that into these small and medium-sized businesses and mostly non-for-profits as well. So, because as you know, people don't really have a lot of money sometimes. And if you can give a better service, then yeah, everyone sort of wins out of that. So it's pretty hard to have your own IT, internal IT Impossible. Uh, consultant. I mean, there's, we're the same as a lot of not, not-for-profits are small businesses that, uh, you know, every cent you've got, every dollar you've got, going to make the most effective use of, but we've got some of the same challenges from an IT perspective and possibly even more, you know, like we have, we carry a lot of uh, risk and burden for our clients as do a lot of businesses and not-for-profits, you know, looking after and maintaining people's information. I'm sure we'll get to sort of data security in a second. Is there any, in terms of utilitize, excuse me, the business itself, you mentioned that not-for-profit and uh, small to medium businesses. Yeah. What is kind of your wheelhouse in terms of the type of uh, clientele that you look after? Well, we've got everyone from, I guess, a two-seated organisation to large community health centres across Victoria and, you know, uh, medical dispenser, pharmaceutical dispensaries, I'm trying to think of the wording. But yeah, we've got a lot of non-for-profits, as I mentioned, and that's sort of Steve's expertise in Microsoft as well, understanding, you know, where, the, where they can sort of leverage off some of those non-for-profit uh, benefits. He sort of passes those on and says, well, you know, how you're sort of operating at the moment, you can probably cut out these licenses and, and do this and have cost savings that way. And yeah, it's mostly just helping out the little guys or then in some cases, the big guys that we've got as well, saving them the bottom line as well as improving their services as well. So depending on what licenses you get, you get security uplifts and so people don't know about that type of thing. So yeah, that answers. I suppose question. nearly every industry is using tech. Yeah. Are they? So just about any occupation now, any business, any small, medium, large business needs security. And yeah. then they're obviously leveraging it. I think in here, we, if we didn't have the ability to get online for one day, imagine we, we would do very little. We, we yeah, we'd do be in trouble. Pretty much nothing. Yeah. It's exactly. amazing how reliant you become on it. So yeah, you need 100%. it to be tight and safe. Yeah. So we'll get to AI and uh, sort of data security what are some of the other sort of baseline services that uh, Utilitize offer to, to their clients? Yeah, so Utilitize is an um, IT managed service provider. So I like saying we do everything from IT to A, A to Z to IT. So 
your day-to-day activities, your, you know, your help desk. We offer that strategic planning, like where do you want to go now? And if you want to have growth, how are we going to make sure you can have that scalability? The IT security part is a, is a big part as well. It's not so much being secure, it's making sure you feel safe. So it's like, well, like you were saying before, we're using people's data, how we're storing that, where we're storing it, and making sure that your customers as well feel safe with that too, because it's, it's a selling point for us, but it's also a selling point for yourselves as well. It's like, well, why would people want to come to you and go to your business instead of someone else's? Well, they, they can have that security and feel safe that they're not going to be one of the next many banks and office. I mean, they're, they're big examples, but we've got a lot of policies in place. And like I was saying too, Steve's brought a lot, a lot of that sort of big business expertise and that type of thing and bring it into that, our, our, our business and, and essentially our customers. So it's, I was impressed. So coming from Gen U, how they sort of were operating, I can see a lot of gaps which I think we can fix for them. So I'm like, well, why are they doing that where utilities are doing this for, you know, small one to two size businesses? We're applying all these security policies so that, yeah, they're not compromised. And so, so what, just on that, we'll go a little bit granular on that. What are some of the efficiencies or areas that you've seen in your different roles compared to what uh, Steve and the crew are doing at utilities? What are some of the sort of common areas that businesses or not-for-profits can get some traction in getting some IT managed services? I guess a lot of it's just transparency and just that communication point. So a lot of time you have your IT people where it's like a, a very transactional sort of relationship. It's like, I need you now. It's sort of, I think what we do differently is we try and reach out to you and say, hey, we've, we've found this. Let's try and fix that by doing this. Or, you know, there's a, there's a latest, uh, what do you call it? Security sort of breach within some sort of sector. We're going to apply, uh, for example, something happens to the medical side of things. We'll apply that to, you know, your lawyers, your yeah, um, your Burke Britons, that type of thing. I think that's a lot where, I don't know, the care factor's there, I think. And we're, we're, we have a lot of sayings throughout the office and we try to be reactive. No, so we try to be proactive instead of reactive. So you don't want to be that person that call when your problem, we want to try and work with you to solve those problems. So it's, I know it sounds kind of cliche, but... It's, no, that's, it's, that's it's the, cliche, but so many people still get that wrong, I think. Like that's, people say it. Yeah. But if you can do it, then that's what sets you apart from others. Yeah. One of the thoughts as technology has sort of taken hold in a lot of businesses, there's been this sense that the the need for people and the need for relationships will decrease. I don't know. We've spoken about this on like every other podcast. Nearly every small business owner or someone from a, a business that we talk to, the common theme is as technology increases and automation increases, it actually doesn't decrease the need for people and relationships. It it increases it. And I think that sort of face-to-face or belly-to-belly or whatever you want to call it, emphasis or element of any business, I think is becoming more prevalent. I know for us, like with our clients, the importance, like AI and technology is a tool. You can use it for good. You can use it for bad. You can use it well. You can use it poorly. But what it essentially allows us to do, you mentioned being a problem solver. That's the way we like to think of ourselves as financial advisors and technology allows, creates some efficiency mm-hmm. so that we can be more face-to-face with our clientele. And so I think in, in your business and in many other businesses, that's really the, I think that's the, the, the story for, for technology. If done well with the right people, with the right support, with the right, right relationships, it can be a huge positive. That's where I suppose the focus needs to be. And for people that are scared of technology talking to people like yourself and saying, hey, it doesn't necessarily need to be scary. You just need to have the right things in place to make sure that you can, Yeah, it, it sort of rolls into the background and becomes business as usual. Yeah. So it works for you, not against you, I find as well. Just sort of, yeah, you don't, one less thing to worry about. I so think with us, I think about it, it frees us up when we're using it well to have more time to communicate directly with our clients. So in the past, you'd have a, a client interaction and we'd need to go and type out all our notes and, and just little things and you move into the phases of dictation and that became quite quite efficient. But then now you're moving past that to actually capturing that conversation live. Quick check. Yep, that's what I said. You've spent an extra hour communicating and actually having a personal connection with it, with another client or with that person again. So you become more efficient. It actually helps us build more stronger relationships with our existing and, and other clients as well. So it just makes our time much more efficient, I think. That's where we yeah. have to use it. I think one thing with that as well, and I think our era of social media we're becoming very antisocial as well. We're, we're losing that sort of face-to-face 
sort of side of things too as well. I'll post something and then you get that communication out. But yeah, I don't like social media too much because I find it's very antisocial. You post it out, don't know who's talk, who you're talking to and you don't get that feedback mm. back. I'd rather have that conversation and like bounce off it, get that energy. And yeah, it's more personal. I think that's the old soul in me a little bit. But I, I think th- people appreciate that. Like that's, yeah. for us, it's it's picking up the phone and having a 10 minute you know, conversation rather than a couple of emails back and forth. You can get a, you can get a feel for someone's tone, their you know their emotion and their mood really, really quickly. And on email, it's a bit, it's a bit hard. So yeah. we'd rather spend our time having those connections, whether it be in person or over the phone, even Zoom and things. At least you're getting some verbal and some visual rather than just yeah. you know dry emails and things too. Mm. So, sorry, you go. Look, you have probably got your kids as well, and they do Snapchat and it's just like send one picture and that's a conversation. You're like. Where's this? Where's the where's the body in that? Where's the substance? It's just I don't get it. I feel like I'm old and don't understand it. But yeah. it's like I've yeah. tried my best to understand it. I think we mentioned earlier that technology is a tool. Social media, I think I've I've come around to thinking it a bit more in that way. Like it's it's a tool that could potentially be used for for good or for evil. Yeah. And it's finding that that line. Even with kids, you know, technology offers them some great opportunities to to learn. But it also creates some risks that if they're not educated, I mean, what the same things that I would apply to my kids in terms of education around technology is, I'd imagine, the same kind of things that you and your business do for small businesses, like education, educate yeah. about how you can actually make the most effective and efficient use of the technology while also reducing the risks of it being uh, uh, used in the incorrect way. So, yeah. Um, that's probably a nice segue into the the kind of two hot topics at the moment, which are sort of AI and machine learning. And we're using a little bit of it today. We're hopefully yeah, it's working. We're, we're, we've got a, an AI bot recording this conversation, you know, summarizing our conversation. Let's talk about sort of the the rise of AI and then I suppose the thinking about the ethics and responsibility of AI and how as business owners we need to be I suppose, aware that it can create some efficiencies, but also conscious of the challenges and risks that it poses. Yeah. So I guess if I ask you guys, what do you think was the first AI technology for for consumers, like for your, your sort of layman? Good question. Because I, I watched uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey with the kids <laughs> like a couple of weeks ago and in there, so this is, this is 1969 or something like that, and they were, AI and machine learning was was discussed pretty heavily in it. They had a little, if you've seen it, you probably haven't seen it. Anyway, but it was interesting to me that like, what's that, 70 years ago, AI and machine learning was on the cards. People were thinking about it. Now, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing the answer to this is a lot earlier than we anticipated that it was. Well, yeah. I guess for the for the layman, it's like Google. Google is yeah. your, your basic AI sort of tool. You search for something, it looks through the whole of the internet to try and get you what, you, what you're trying to search for. And I guess... The next iteration of that, in a way, at a sort of basic form, is Google Translate. Mm. Like, it, you type in something in English. If you go into Bali, for example, uh, how much is the handbag? So you, you type that in, and then it'll give you that in Indonesian. But it's using AI in the background there to try and compute it, understand it. You know, do I have to put him before the context, like pretext and whatever it might be? That's its its first sort of form. So people don't really understand. It's been around for a while. It's only recently that it's, uh, one, been a hot topic and some really fast developments on, I guess, how we can use it and use machine learning and deep learning and being a lot smarter with AI as well and integrating that with, you know, everyday living. It's, you go on Facebook, it's, there's algorithms which use AI to tell you what what information to, to give to you. So should we be concerned? I mean, I hear lots of uh, people talking about artificial general intelligence becoming sentient. Is that the right word? Sentient? basically becoming its own entity and, and being able to make decisions independent of people. Should yeah. we be worried about this or uh, is it overblown? It's just media oh, hype. I think you got to approach it with caution, to be honest. So it's like you wouldn't go tell a stranger all your personal information. And so it's like, why would you put it on the internet? So if I guess an, uh, again, an example for that is, you know, write me a letter to somebody to do on this and tell them I want to pay them X amount from this bank account. Like it, it's a little bit far-fetched, but you wouldn't put all that information. You'd say, how do I write up the bank statement? And it will give you, like this This is using like a chat GPT sort of instance. You wouldn't put personal information to that. So I guess 
when you whatever information you feed to these engines, it's using that, storing it somewhere, and then spitting it out to somebody else. So I think another instance is sort of using Wikipedia. It's sort of open source sort of information that people were storing. So it could your AI would potentially look at that, and I, I could say the sky is grey, where someone else, majority of people could say the sky is blue. So the AI would sort of look at that in the background and say, well, majority of the people are saying it's blue. Some people are saying it's gray. Potentially it's gray. It's a bluey gray color. So are you getting the right information as a result of that from the inputs that's been put into it? So I think it sort of becomes a human responsibility to make sure we're feeding these things the correct information, putting the correct information in there. So then we get in good quality stuff out. Is it sort of just balancing probabilities to an extent? Like Yeah, basically, yeah. But I mean, there's, as we know, computers don't have emotions. Otherwise, you know, Terminator will be here and Arnie will be doing a lot more destruction. But yeah, it's it's learning from everyone's inputs. Like and everything's tracked these days. You, you don't know if you're being watched by anyone. You know, Google's always listening. You say, hey, Siri, and it'll start talking. I'll make sure that doesn't say anything. <laughs> yeah, it's just... I oh, know you, you, you feel safe with it all because it's helping you out. That AI is a great tool to be more productive. So should but, we be worried or not? Well, you tell me. Yeah. Well, I, I have a... There's a I've, Jay's do, you, like, do you feel Jay, worried Jay's like it? the... Like, oh, from my perspective, he's like the big embracer, but he's also the great skeptic of it because yeah. he's like binned all his Google Homes, but he's using AI all the time. Like, Well, well yeah, I, I'm, I'm torn. I think there's, yes. I'm torn because I recognize as a business owner the efficiencies that this will create. But from a, my, my skepticism, I suppose, with technology is that everything, nearly everything that has been delivered to us under the guise of creating efficiency and safety, in fact, goes the other way. So emails, for example. So emails were going to be the, the, the holy grail in terms of creating great efficiencies of communication. In fact, it's become a deep, dark hole of you know people getting swallowed in their emails and time-consuming yep. social media. Again, this would be a great way for you to connect with your friends conveniently with old-school friends, yet it becomes addictive and people get you know start sharing information that they shouldn't be. So I'm, I'm very cautious, and I think that that cautious optimism I think is a good thing because it actually as we're making these changes which I think are inevitable I'm also knowing that we need to have good people in our corner that can help us navigate some of those challenges yeah so again I I'm certainly not all in to the when I'm 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 not all in that I'm just going to hand over my entire life to technology and let it just run everything that I do but yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm still, but, still cautious. But I mean, if you look at, if you watch your TV, you're hearing all these ads of, you know, we're using AI to, to do this and that. And it's like the reason why computers were first developed. Like the com computers were made to help make things faster for humans. And, you know, instead of writing something out, we can type it up and then make, make multiple copies out of it, like as a really basic form. So AI is the same thing. It's just to help productivity. But yeah, there is that caution side of it where it can be used for, you know, trying to hack you, trying to make you vulnerable in terms of giving you, just trying to think of the right way to say it. It's like, well, it can it can work out ways in which it can manipulate you. And then by using algorithms, how your sort of actions and how you access a computer, like, well, we know you use X, Y, Z, so we're going to try and send an email from a particular person. So then you click on it and then we can take advantage of you. So that's sort of malicious software at, at its at its core, I guess. So it's, it's good and it's bad, but it's trying to identify, yeah, the best ways of using it. So it's like anything, isn't it? Like it's just a balance thing. Like yeah. it's just about having that balance of not, you know, you don't be completely skeptical of something and don't use it at all, but you've also got to be a little bit hesitant and can't just go completely everything all in on this thing because you open yourself up, which yeah. is like anything, like diet or anything we've talked about in a yeah. realm of different podcasts. But so we've got to use it in sort of play in that middle zone a little bit, but also be pushing forward to make sure we're using it as much as we can safely as well. Yeah. I think that's where we need to get support from people like yourself, where we go, right, like what do you suggest is the best way or safest way we can use this to get the most out of it and then continue to push that forward rather than just sort of sit and just wait. Yeah. So I mean, it's like with when you, when you want to do any sort of process is you're always thinking, is there a better way of doing this? Can you know, to offshore it to somebody that can do it to it, you know, 
that sort of process remotely or can I click a button and then have an automation that does a whole lot of things for me? So I guess it's sort of going back to something we do as well. Steve sort of created a cyber predict IT. So in terms of using AI for good, this is a product that he puts into a workplace or as a service that uses machine learning to understand and monitor your your network. So it looks for so, uh, changes in, in activity. So say, for example, if you come in of a morning, you're going to check your emails, you're going to you know check LinkedIn or look at the sales at Maya, whatever it is, and then it would read those patterns, understand them, and then find a deviation from that. So if you come in and your, your computer logs in, and then it starts sending 100 emails, it starts sending big packets of data or sending two gig of, of, of files, whatever it is, this particular product looks at that and says, hey, there's something weird going on here. This could be... Ben doesn't normally do that in the mornings. Yeah, Ben doesn't do that and alerts somebody, which with the product that we have, and alerts and say, well, okay, this looks bad. Let's cut that computer off. And then this is at a really high level. And then alert you and say, well, your your computer's compromised. Let's look at what we can do to resolve that. So this is an application and, and a product that we're, that he's developing with a really cool guy, Adam. So he's... um, What's Adam's surname? He's going to kill me. I mean, uh, I put it on the spot. He, every time I think of Adam, he's an Irish guy and he, I just think of potatoes. Like, <laughs> yeah, Adam, Adam, Adam potatoes. potatoes. That'll do. Yeah. But um, yeah, he, he's a CEO of Cyber Predict, so he's managing that. So he's he's faced counterterrorism and worked in with the, uh, it's going to kill me again, with the Queensland Police and yeah, a few other big corporations with KPMG as well. And yeah, so he's a really smart guy with in terms of that cyber security side of things. And every time he talks to me and I'm like, this is next level stuff with what he's talking about. So he's in a way, one of the products he's got too is looking at malicious software and encrypted, I'm probably going to get this wrong, encrypted packets. So if I send it to you, that's in a way that you can't unlock it, he can find malicious software on that particular product or that whatever that, that packet is without encrypting it. So it's cool stuff like that, which... That's where it comes sort of back to AI. They're using AI to find out patterns, find out, you know, what does this look like compared to something good to bad and using that machine learning and saying, well, these are all good, good things. These are bad things. If you see this within that, resolve it. Yeah. So what, what immediately comes to mind is that yeah, I mean, you were going to, you gave me a weird look there, Ben. I was, I was thinking, scared. yeah, no, I was just thinking about AI and programs, awesome programs like that that can work in the positive other side of that there's i'm assuming there's the the uh, the the criminal elements the yeah that he can also ai is a tool and they can use it and create programs yeah. as well i suppose one of my questions is how what practically like small business owners and not-for-profits how can they what, what are some practical tips for them to actually be safe with the utilization of ai and the fact that ai can be used by other people to to negatively affect your business? Yeah, I think the, the core of it is just education. It's just understanding, am I going to be getting an email from ComBank hang on, with, with NAB as an example? So it's like, well, it, in terms of email, making sure that if it looks sus, it probably is sus. So what's, what, what's sus? So for someone who's listening, to, and again, my father-in-law is probably going to be listening to this. Uh, what, let's remind him, what, what is sus, what's a sus email look like? Well, uh, like at a baseline, a contact that you don't have, like a, not a regular contact asking you for something that... Yeah. I mean, everyone's personal. probably had that that mum text message as well that was sort of going around, hey, this is your mum, can you... Like, I'm stuck at the supermarket, can you send me 20 bucks? And you're like, well, that's not my mum's number. I've got my mum saved as something else in my phone and she's not with ComBank. I know her bank details. So there's a couple of things to... I don't know, just look for those red... Like, it's out of the blue. Well, if it's out of the blue... How do I make, how do I identify that? Like it's, it's, sometimes it feels like it's common sense, but then like, I think the fact is we're exposed to it a lot and we use, like we're emailing just those things a lot where some people, they're not, they're not exposed to, they're not on the, they're not, especially people that maybe retire, they're not involved in tech maybe as much. So they're not seeing and getting educated like we are about yeah. spam and all the things that come through. Mm. So they get a text message and they're just, yeah, it must be for me. Like it's off CityLink, haven't paid my CityLink again. Yeah. Like that. But have you travelled? But have you travelled? Like, traveled. you know, I always look at it and go, you can tell quite quickly on most of them. Some yeah. of them are pretty good. Like some of them are pretty believable and they're probably going to get better with AI. Is that yeah. the... Well, 
I look, not that I've been on the dark web, but you can go on the dark web and purchase these these spam sort of uh, packages. So you can say, well, I want to attack um, these amount of people when you pay for that as a service through the dark web, which is really scary if you think about it. But you can, for example, like, you know, the uh, Australia Post one, you can, as an example, I don't know if you can or not, I haven't been on the dark web, but you can purchase that to say, well, I can make X amount of revenue from this potential uh, phishing scheme or wherever it might be. You can purchase that. So to try and, as you were saying, asking before, how do you stop that? It's just education, talking about it, understanding what's good and what's bad. And if it's if it's out of the blue or it's different to your norm, question it. Ask, hey, call call us, uh, the Australia Post. Hey, have I got a package there? Or have are you wanting money from me? And they'll 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 tell you no because the numbers on there will be different to what their standard numbers are. But everyone's seen malicious emails and stuff come through, and they look identical. And it's really hard, but if there's a link, question the link. There's ways in which you can hover over the top of that link and it would tell you uh, if it doesn't look like australiapost.com, if it's like my post or no, that's probably not a good example, but your post office in Australia or something instead of Australia Post. Those are things to sort of look out for in, in, in an email or a text message. If you're, But again, education. We're, we're sort of, in my age, my, my demographic, we're, we're brought, brought up with a device in our hands. We're sort of digital natives in a way and... I guess my parents in a way have grown up a little bit with it, but my mom still has trouble. She like, she texted me the other day actually and saying, do you need money? And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, you just asked me for 20 bucks. And I was like, well, I was to transfer some money. And I'm like, no, I didn't. She goes, oh, I think it's a scam. So she in a way knew to call me and ask, what do you need money for or whatever it was? So she's got some idea, but the fact that she saw that and didn't realize it was a scam at the start, She's sort of like halfway, like she can read there's a, this is a bit sus. Some people just go, oh, yeah, must oh, be funny. Oh, no. My mum's very little lads. <laughs> at least she asked the question. I know, I know of someone who had a similar thing and they just, just assumed oh, it was correct. And it just, it was, they just went yeah. with it. It was more how much money do you want me to send you? I'm like, that's not me. <laughs> yeah. The challenging thing I think with our clients is we want them to trust us and we do. So we use things like DocuSign and we send them emails and they sometimes get text messages from us. And so you do want them to trust us, but at the same time, you want them to be held in a skeptical, in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. So again, for any of our clients or potential clients that are out there listening, what we'd say is that if in doubt, call us. If in doubt, call yeah. us. Don't If you're worried about anything, whether it be... Because I mean, data security, we'll talk about this from a from a business point of view about other ways that we can actually secure data. But from us as a business, a financial advisory business, uh, data protection, data integrity is uh, is critical. Yeah. Um, what what are some of the other ways that businesses looking to secure their data? So ha- ha- that how are they making sure that the data they collect from their clients is held secure? Like where, where should you put the data? Where shouldn't you put the data? You, well, you touched on a few of them, like don't be putting personal data into chat GBT, but how do you protect the data that you've got for your clients? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So there's there's several ways in which you can do that. Within, I guess, a cloud environment, making sure that you know, you've got encrypted devices, you've got those multi-factor authentication to be able to access that data. So when you're putting it somewhere, you're using two ways to access it. So multi-factor is using a password and well, essentially two ways of accessing uh, an application or, you know, I, w- I want to access this particular file. So you get a text message and a call, or you got to type your password and say, yeah, this is me. So you got, it, it knows your voice in terms of some banks that they use that. So there's a, the Australian cybersecurity, they have the essential eight. There's a whole lot of policies and, and methods in there, which businesses should ad- adhere to and apply to ensure that their data is safe, that the they have policies in place to make sure that, you know, if I put something there, I know it's saved, it's encrypted. If my laptop gets stolen, no one can take the hard drive out and plug it in and get that information because that, that drive is encrypted and there's no, you need like a, I think it's kind of how many characters it is to try and crack that. So making it harder for people to access that data if it's compromised in any way. So I guess it, it, when you go anywhere, a, if you're giving your credit card, do you trust that person? Do you trust that no. company? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's just like, well, if I do give it to you, what, you know, do I, do you have any certifications to what? And then like, I think the big key thing for it is, you know, everyone can be secure, but 
are you safe? And just think, am I being safe with what I'm doing here? And do I feel safe with the person? If you don't, ask the question. So even just those little things, you still see friends, family, clients who carry a list of passwords around on a piece of paper in their wallet. Like, like that's just, we just got to get past that. Yeah. So password wallets, that's an interesting one. So yeah. But what, what are your thoughts on password wallets? Which are the good ones? How, how should you best set them up? Well, I would always ask, don't have like a, a password that's like GoCats, for example, um, I'm a cap supporter, have like, we are Geelong, the greatest team of all. So the reasons for, don't use those passwords, but, <laughs> and they're not my passwords, but it, it, there are password vaults, which you can save your passwords into. And there's some credible ones out there. Some of them have been compromised, but which ones? <laughs> I'll get back to you on it. Okay. Just tell, is there a couple that you would, is there a couple that are reputable? Like, Yes and no. It's just whichever one you feel safe for. So if you think about it, if you're getting something so free, Google passwords, the, the, the yes password? and no, no. Okay. Oh, what about? I'm app? on the record here, so I've got to. That's okay. <laughs> uh, what about the uh, the Apple password? Yes. Yeah, so, so all those use some form of biometrics or multi-factor authentication. So so, so like face recognition, yeah, face recognition, your thumb, or you know, using password in a text message. So if you have some sort of multi-factor authentication to access those, yep. then you should feel safe to get it because no one's going to have your thumb and your password unless they cut your thumb yep. off. And yep. what, about last, what about last? What about LastPass? I use LastPass. Okay. Oh, I feel better now. Oh. But they have been compromised. Yeah. And so, what, in being compromised, is that because some? Because I know with LastPass, I mean, you can choose not to have the third party. Oh, sorry, two factor authentication set up. <laughs> yeah. So I think they have enforced that with a lot of yeah. with their customers as well because of what's happened previously, but. A lot of those can, uh, have and can be compromised at any point too. So it's like making sure you're changing your passwords. And th this comes back to the education piece as well. It's like, when was the last time you changed your password? When, when, how often are you using that password for other ways of logging in? Yep. So we're not going sort of back to the GoCats and we are the greatest team of all, having those two sort of different types of passwords. You've got a password and a passphrase. So understanding... It might take, uh, I did an education piece on this, but if um, you've got like 12, 10 characters, whatever it might be, it, it takes an AI bot to crack in about two hours, three hours for, by brute force. So you're changing like A, B, A, B, C, A, B, C, D, where if you have Jesus. something with, you know, we are the greatest team of all, which is like 25 uh, characters with like an exclamation mark on the end, that will take, I think it's a gazillion years or something, a long time to crack because you're going to go, one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Because they're just basically guessing every possible scenario. Well, uh, and they can yeah. do it that quickly that with Wait, a short phrase, two like hours. Quantum computing really kicks in with AI and then it can just, whoop, it just runs the numbers. Yeah. So that's what, that's what AI, in terms of being against humans, that's where it, it's bad. So that's not so much bad. That's where it can compromise us. And it's using AI for, for evil. Yeah. Okay. So to sort of fix that though. You, you can have, like, I changed all my password on my personal one. I got five email addresses. Go off the grid and just start breeding so chickens. Just start digging the, holes and putting cash in it or something. <laughs> or go back to <laughs> cash. Trading only. lemons for nectarines. And <laughs> yeah, well, that, yeah, that's, that's Bitcoin, really. <laughs> yeah, that's going with that. But you can change it to not to remove your passwords completely. So then you can have an authenticator app. So then that, that password or that particular code changes every 30 seconds or 40 seconds or whatever it is. So then you don't have to type a password in. So no one can try and use brute force to, to try multiple ways of accessing it. You have an app on your phone that is with you all the time. You have to use two-factor authentication to get into that app. And then once you're in that app and you use that code to log into your device or whatever it might yeah, be. That's what we use for a lot of our stuff. And I was going to ask you about that because it's sort of been an old school thing. Like yeah, I remember the Bendigo Bank brought in about 20 yeah. years ago and they started, you had this little, well, little thing handkerchief. you carried around and you push the button on it and get the code. It was yeah. groundbreaking. It's sort of still there but in a different Yeah. Form. Well, it's just modernized now yeah. and using computers to, you know, everyone's got a, a smartphone in their pocket now and, you know, we've got, we've got that calculator with us. So we've got that extra tools to be able to ensure we're safe when we're accessing data and that type of thing. So that's one of the things we Im imply with a lot of our, well, all our customers. We make sure that they are safe and they've got these best practices and policies put in place. So then they, we don't want them to be compromised. So we're trying to put th and, and that education thing as well. So it's, it's really interesting and it's always evolving as well, but it's, yeah, 
having someone that those trusted advisors to make sure you're on board with, to make sure that you're getting all those. I was going to say before, I was thinking when you're talking about it, for people who are a bit worried about it, you've sort of got two options is you just run away and hide from tech or you try and educate yourself enough to be more yeah. comfortable with it. Yeah. And a lot better just to try and learn a little bit. You don't have to know the whole thing, but just know basic steps to protect yourself and be comfortable using it. Because if you try and just pull back and not use emails or net banking or anything like that, like you're going to, it's going to be hard because everything's yeah. moving that way. A lot of, lot of, I guess, elderly people are like, oh, no, I'm not going to put my stuff on the internet. I'd rather have, you know, like you were saying, the chickens digging it out in the backyard looking for my money. But it's educating them and saying, you know, it is safe to do so. If you're wanting to do it, I can help you with that. And that's where, where you, you guys sort of come into play with that as well. It's sort of, you know, we can help manage your money and we can do it safely and securely. And this is how we do it. And then making people feel safe to be able to, you know, engage with you and be like, oh, these are good guys. I know they're, they've got the technical side thing as well. And they they know how to use my money. So, yeah. But yeah, I think COVID forced a lot of people into the tech, and then now it's about just keeping them like because we couldn't see them. So a lot of people who would never have done a Zoom or a Teams in their life, yeah, forced to. So they've sort of had that gateway into it, and then now it's like right, reinforce that it's safe and continue to use it where yeah. where they can and to make their life easier. Well, I think the big part though, working in a school as well, is we we sort of assume that kids are. Di the digital natives, we assume that they know how to use devices, but it's how do they use it properly? Like I, I always like telling this story. One, I used to talk to some of the kids when I was at, in, at school and I said, you got $20 in your account and I want to try and hack that and get that. How do I get it? And they're like, you can't. I'm like, okay, well, I've got a button and it says, forgot my password. So I can click on that and it's got three questions. What street did you grow up on? Oh, and you got, you put on, on Facebook. Oh, this is me at Smith Street, you know, which is catching up with my mates. So I can use AI to look through that, find anything that says street. Cool, I've got that one. Mother's maiden name. Oh, I'm catching up with the Smith sisters, whatever it might, it might be, or the Smith side of the family. Cool, maiden name done. And then I've got... Model of the first car or something. Yeah, yeah, model of the first car. And you're like, yeah, just got my first car and taking it out for a drive. And you're like, okay, that's a red Mazda. Cool, I've got three ticks. I can access your account. I've stolen your 20 bucks. So when you put something online... What are you putting on that? Where street did you grow up on? Oh, I, I, I grew up on Sesame Street because it's so so much fun. Cool. This is my mum. Yeah, she's the fairy godmother because she's awesome and does whatever. And this is my car. It's my red Ferrari. So I've stopped someone in three times to try and access my account and you've saved 20 bucks. And when you see the kids, you tell them, they're like, oh yeah, why am I putting that on there? But no one's really teaching them the right way to use social media, AI, technology. It's just assumed that oh, they're immersed in it, they're going to understand it, they're going to use it. So it's, I think, our responsibility and everyone's responsibility to understand how we're using it properly and ethically and the correct way of using it so it's not used against us. So, we yeah. Go and change a few passwords. Or oh, no. I don't want to, I don't want to scare you, but no, it's, no. it's amazing when, you, when, I, when I spoke to that and even when I tell it now, you, people feel uncomfortable. You're like, oh, what have I put online? What, what, is, what information is out there about me? Should I be sharing things? What should I be sharing? The secret questions is makes you like, I could probably answer half of the people at the back secret questions because you just, yeah. like, if you know people a little bit, you probably know most of those things because they're not really hard questions. Yeah. yeah. And with AI, it doesn't take long that, yeah. for AI to learn about you. Like one of your friends would know you. Yeah, that's it. So then that's just out there yeah. for everyone. Yeah. I, I said before about convenience that uh, everything sort of done under the guise of convenience ends up being something that is either inconvenient or puts you at risk. Every time now, because it annoys me time-wise when I've got to put in, I've got to go to the authenticator and I keep reminding myself it's good. Like every time something's a little bit inconvenient and there's a little bit of pain, I yeah, go, cool, that's, that's like a, a little barrier. Like if it's way too convenient, like I just have to click on one thing and I'm in, Yeah, I'm thinking I'm at risk here. So anyone yeah. out there that uh, thinks that, uh, you know, two-factor authentication or, you know, having to get, I was helping my in-laws set up banks and said, oh, it's so annoying. I have to get a text message and then I have to put that code into here. I said, that's a good thing. It's yeah. just, if it's, it's, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of a lag time. It also gives you a chance to think, actually, is this, is this legit? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like you said, if it's an inconvenience for you, think about the person trying to access your data on the other side. It's going to be even more inconvenience for them Correct. and a lot harder for them as well. So it's probably a good way of thinking. If it's hard for me, it's going to be hard for someone else. 
So a yeah. little bit of pain for uh, protection, I think, is a is a good move. What else we've t- talked on talked about AI? We've talked about sort of cyber security. What is there anything else on those two fronts that you'd like to speak on to any of our listeners, whether they be not for profit, small business owners, or individuals out there? Anything else that you'd like to cover off on uh, on those fronts? I mean, for me, it's just sort of asking yourself. Am I, I'm, I'm secure because, you know, whoever's sort of managing or doing whatever you think for you, they're saying we're doing this, but challenge them to just say, how am I safe? What are you putting in place? What's, if I get compromised, how do I get my data back? Can I get my data back? I mean, if it's free, nothing's for free. You, you got to, if you pay for something then you're going to get something back for it. So just go, like you were saying before, change your passwords, make sure you got MFA put in place. Think about Where's my data being stored? Is it stored in Australia or offshore? How do you how do you know that? So you ask, I suppose. Yeah, ask the question. So yeah. you know, if yeah, it, who can access my data? You know, if you're you've got one shared mailbox between five people in an organisation, which a lot of people do, it's like the admin account. Everyone can access that. Who can access that? Is that got a shared password? Usually, it's just one static password. Reduce that. Have it add into your personal in, uh, inbox for example, in Outlook. So then you have to authenticate to be able to access that. So you've got that extra level of security. Little things like that, which a lot of businesses don't understand. So it's, I find what we do is bring that expert, uh, enterprise expertise, That's more, I like that word, into those small and medium businesses because they don't necessarily have that IT resource on board. They haven't got that education. They don't know. And then as soon as you don't know, then that's when you get compromised because there's, there's back doors into everything. And yeah, and then you, you'll be calling someone to say, well, how do I get this back? Even then, if you had the desire to want to do it in, in your business, like yeah. it's it's not going to be the best value for money time spent doing it. Like let's say that Jay just got obsessed with it and started doing it. Or like he would have spent hours, weeks doing it when he could have been doing something else that would have benefited the business more. Like it's a prime example of just outsource that to an expert Yeah, and, but there's, and know it's done. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons of ways of, you know, looking at, even to go on the Australian cybersecurity site, they've got ways in which a whole lot of checks that you can go through. I think it's got the questionnaire on there. You know, do you have more than 12 characters in your password? Do you have MFA set up? Similar to what I was saying before, where, where are you saving your data? You're saving Sorry, it. can you say that again? I'll put it in the show notes. Where was it? Australian Cybersecurity Centre. Yep. There's a link in there somewhere which you can sort of do a, a, a quick check. But alternatively, you can call us and we can we can help you out with that and just sort of see where you're at and your sort of stance. That's at utilitize.com.au. So let, what, what good lead in, nice segue. Let's yeah, let's talk right. about how people can get a hold of you. They can go to utilitize.it.com.au. That's a website. U- utilitize.it.com.au, yeah. Yep. How can they get a hold? So if someone wants to reach out, can they call you personally? Can they email you? Yeah, all those, yeah. Yeah. I think I'll put it in the show notes. Like yeah. One. I saw that on you. You know think? But yeah, just I'm I'm happy to have a chat and just sort of see where you're currently at in terms of your security stance and just say and then we can give you recommendations like we'd probably put this in place. This is this this looks really good, but you might want to do it this way or whatever it might be. And like I was saying too, that Adam, you'll like this. There's a picture of a Adam one, potato. Yeah, Adam potatoes. Yeah, oh, you're throwing me off. Yeah. <laughs> he, he had a a picture of a a big full drive and it had you know a hundred inch wheels on it and it was compliant. And because it had a small spare tire on the back, but he wasn't safe. So he's, he's got all these things in place, but this the particular car driver, not really articulating, it's better to have a picture there, but the, the person, if they got a flat tire, they're putting a, a 16 inch rim on a hundred inch tire. So they're not safe. So making sure you're understanding what you got in place will actually work for your business. So you, you can put all these things, you're like, oh yeah, we've got security because they, they say we have, but, but yeah. what does the security mean? Do they imply uh, policies? Do they have ways in which my data is safe, essentially? So they're not just ticking the box and bare minimums. You want to be have a, a high level of security and be yeah. leading it, not just doing it because you feel like you have to. Yeah, and it's just you know we've got to comply against sort of regulations wherever it is, and yeah, you know, yeah, they they told us that we've got this in place, but what does that mean? And question it to say well, what what is what am I? How is my data safe? What are you doing to make sure it is safe? How, what happens if it gets compromised? How do I get my data back? And those type of things. You should be able to have answers to all those questions. And if you don't, then you should find out. Cool. Now, where else? Got, you've said the website. Are you guys on Instagram, Facebook, uh, uh, YouTube? Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. 
I want to start doing some more of this type of podcast and, and videos and that type of thing. But yeah, that's in the, in the pipeline, but yeah, just give us a call. We're, we're just in Mercer street as well on the corner there. So what's the address? What number Mercer street? 155. So okay. just on the corner there. So close by central. All right. Well, we'll uh, link to all that in the show notes. Ben, did you want to say anything before we shut up shop? No, it's good. I think it's a good intro. I think again, in, as this evolves, it would be good to hear again in six or 12 months and, and hear what are you seeing now? What are people doing? What's the next big, you know, solution and big headache that's coming as well? I think it just evolved so quickly in the last 12 months like alone. Yeah. So I look forward to seeing what the next next phase of it is. Yeah. I guess with the AI side of things too, it's just a, like you're saying, it's evolving. It's going into videos. It's going into pictures. It's going into text messages and, you know, it's not so much just a type signing in and get a response. It's draw me a picture of, you know, Mickey Mouse with dinosaur legs and you'll get that. And it's what it can get to is scary. But I'll leave with this. It's I'm saying I'm a lot, but AI is sort of endless in a way of what the capabilities are, but it's making sure that you're using it for the right way and making sure that you're being safe again with using it and putting the right information into it to get the right information back. But nice way to close. Obviously. You've scared us enough that I think uh, that people are going to sit up and take notice. So uh, James, thank you very much for making the time to have a chat with us today. And as Ben said, we look forward to having you back on for round two, round three to talk all things AI and cybersecurity in uh, the coming months. No Thanks, worries. mate. Thanks very much. Thank guys. you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, business should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility, do your homework, ask questions and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PB Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading is Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorised representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.